Good to see everybody. Uh, we're making progress, not only with scheduling, but with the team. Uh, I like what I'm seeing in practice. Uh, we play well together right now. We're sharing the ball, uh, playing the right way. Uh, we're almost too unselfish, which is something I like this time of the year. Usually I'm trying to talk a guy into not shooting it quick, but right now I'm trying to get him to shoot the ball, and all they want to do is share it. So that, that bodes well for the upcoming season. Defensively, I think we're, we're on track uh, to be another defensive team that the Aztecs can be proud of. It's good having Nathan Mensa back with his shot blocking. Uh, all the newcomers are picking up uh, concepts. Uh, they're playing hard, and uh, uh, it seems hard to believe, but we're going to have a basketball season starting November 25th against UCLA here in Viejas, and that's really exciting news. You know, going back to when Coach Fisher was here, how, how tricky and difficult was it to ever schedule UCLA, no matter the scenario, home, away, trying to get them to visit? And because of how tricky that's been historically, what kind of an opportunity does it make this game and this this matchup? You know, Coach Fisher never felt he would just go to a one-up game at UCLA without a return game when other Pac-12 teams would play as home and home. So over the years, we've had home and home series with uh, Washington, Arizona, Arizona State, uh, USC, and UCLA, uh, which is their – their history rarely goes on the road in Southern California. Uh, they don't play a road game in the state. You have to go to Poly to play them. But Mick Cronin and I have been friends a long, long time. Uh, with COVID the way it was, uh, we were both scheduled to go to Orlando to play games. Neither one of us were overly excited about putting our teams on a flight for five hours uh, to play basketball during COVID. And so uh, we continued our conversation when Orlando kind of uh, faded away. The events were canceled. Uh, we just stepped into that vacancy, and Mick was more than willing to uh, uh, come play us as part of a Southern California event, along with Pepperdine and UC Irvine, where the teams can just get on a bus, come down to San Diego, and get a couple really quality games out of the event. What do you remember about that last time, 2012? Maybe the game, but also the environment. That's what we're going to be missing, obviously. And I think that's one of the reasons Mick agreed to come, because he knew the building would be empty. But uh, I remember the, the Honda Center, and uh, it was probably three-quarters full with Aztec fans. And uh, see Xavier and Jamal Franklin and that crew uh, beat a good UCLA team was a really memorable night for all of us. Hey, Coach, just wonder if you could um... – sort of elaborate a little bit on on first your relationship with Nick how, how you guys met you're both I know sons of coaches and and uh, and secondly what were those hours first hours like after you found out that Orlando was not going to happen uh, I, I understand you were on the phone quite a bit trying to pull this thing together uh, yeah I've known Mick since he was an assistant at Cincinnati and I was an assistant at Michigan so our relationship goes back many many years and I followed his career with Great interest as he's done an outstanding job at Cincinnati as a head coach and now at UCLA, uh, bringing the Bruins back to uh, national prominence and rankings. Uh, I was never 100% sold that Orlando was a great option for us, but I had to get quality games. And so the only way it looked like I could get Power 5 schools to play me was to go to Orlando. <clears throat> I always wanted to stay closer to home. And we were approached by... At one point, another Pac-12 school trying to hold their own, own MTE, but the field wasn't quite what I wanted. And so it was something I held in the back of my mind, and I had talked to Mick about playing maybe one game this year. We'd be willing maybe to come up to UCLA and play in one game just so I could get on a bus instead of a plane. And then as it progressed, and Orlando was looking like it might not happen, we had already had a conversation about playing. So I called him. I said, would you be interested in coming down here? I'll find two other teams, and we can put an MTE together down here in San Diego. And uh, he was excited by the idea. He, he wanted to play good teams. Uh, he knew that we had been historically good, and so it's credit to him. He's not afraid to, to go to a neutral floor in order to play good games. And it'll be a lot more neutral than it would have been if we had fans in the stands, but uh, – 
I'm excited by him wanting to come here and and then to play a, a very good Pepperdine team in another game here. Uh, obviously, Irvine's been really strong in the Big West for a lot of years, and so for a field that got put together kind of uh, a couple, two, three weeks ago, I think it's as good as any MTE there is. As a quick, as a quick follow-up, um, was there any talk of you having to go to Poly and have this event at Poly? How, how was it that you were able to arrange for it to be at the AOS? Well, Mick and I talked, and, you know, the guidance is different for different counties. And I went to uh, John David Wicker right away and said, can we host one? Are we able to do that? And he told me, absolutely, we can host one. And so I went to Mick and said, I've talked to our athletic director. He tells me we can host, you know, I'd love you to come down. And I think instead of him having to deal with all the other issues of putting one on, uh, game day testing in the Pac-12 and things like that, I told him we could do all that, and uh, honestly, I think our friendship had a lot to him with him saying, I'll come do it for you, Dutch. I'll come down and play there, uh, not only because we're friends. He knew we could get good games, but I think that had a lot to do with us getting the event. Hey, Dutch, uh, just curious, I mean, how, how excited are you to, to start with a ranked opponent? You talked about, you know, in the limited non-conference options you have, have one to maximize that. Irvine historically has been pretty good. I mean, um, how, how satisfied are, you know, we don't we don't know what else you're going to have on the schedule, but in, just in terms of the way you guys are starting, getting off in the right direction in terms of pretty, you know, decent comp competition right out of the gates. Yeah, better than decent competition. <laughs> a really good ranked team. You know, normally we play a couple exhibition games, a closed-door scrimmage, and so uh, we've got our feet underneath us, and and uh, uh some of the game slippage you have in a in an opening game we've already had in in a close scrimmage and an exhibition game and maybe a a, a a a buy game where we think our odds are pretty good at winning to go right into the fire against UCLA will be a test for both teams. Uh, we haven't played 40 minutes yet, you know. We with the the guys we have, we're scrimmaging maybe two 10 minute segments, and and without subs, you know, each team has five or six guys. Uh, they're tired out, and so maybe the first 40 minutes we play as a team will be UCLA on the 25th because we have no other options to do it. And so that will be uh, both nerve-wracking but exciting at the same time. And based on the Mountain West changing the schedule, doing 11 weeks, ending in February, it seems like the conference schedule will start at about mid-December. It seems like a week or two before it normally does. How many games do you think non-conference-wise you're going to be able to fit in before then? And and do you know at this point, are those on home sites? Is there a possibility of more MTEs? Any idea what that looks like? No. Now that the conference has gone to 20 games, we're scheduling, trying to schedule seven uh, non-conference games. I feel like we have five games locked in. Uh, we have a, a Division two opponent, maybe another Division one. we're waiting on. Uh, and we're not going to do anything until we see what the Mountain West does with our schedule. And then maybe we'll fit a D2 around there. NAI team that uh, will come in to play us here is kind of a, 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 a game that will fit more than, than just say, uh, this is when we're playing this game schedule around this Mountain West. We're going to schedule around what the Mountain West wants to do from the rest of the way. Uh, Dutch, follow up on the Mountain West Conference situation. Are you aware, is there a formula to determine how teams at sea level are going to be handled in terms of not getting a ton of games and high altitude, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, do you, do you know how they're going to balance this out in terms of fairness? I don't know, Lee. They, You know, if they're doing a computer-based schedule or what they're doing, I expressed concern during the coaches' meeting that uh, having been in this league 21 years, that playing – Back-to-back -back games at altitude is a tough, tough task. And so I express my displeasure uh, with having to do that. And so if the squeaky wheel gets the grease, hopefully uh, we'll get a few more games at sea level. But I don't know what will happen. Whatever it is, I know one thing. People don't want to hear excuses that you're at altitude, just go play. And so we'll tie the shoes up and we'll just go play and see what it's going to be. And a follow-up. Are you offended at all? I mean, you come off 30-2 and two and you return a ton of talent. And you didn't even get rated in the top 25 preseason. Are you bothered by that? You know, not really, Lee. I mean, I just we were unranked to start last season and had a magical season. And so uh, the rankings go to the Power 5 schools. I mean, I don't know how many non-Power 5 schools are ranked high. 
Uh, if they are, they usually return everybody. But uh, I'm not discouraged by that. Uh, we'll have opportunities if we do what we're supposed to do with our non-conference schedule uh, to put ourselves on the map heading into the conference season. Looking at that conference schedule, though, with the two-game series and one day off in between, I mean, what kind of challenges does that pose, you know, just in preparation? And, and what were just your initial thoughts when you heard the Mount West announce that? You know, I'm not in favor of it other than it's a COVID year, and I think it's a good thing this year to make five road trips instead of nine. Uh, I don't like playing back to back games at altitude. And like I said, it's not like the second game you're going to look out there and we're laying on the floor because we can't breathe. It's just that half step. You know, we're going to be out of position by a half step because maybe we're a little fatigued and, and that's having an effect on us. And that half step makes a difference between winning and losing. And so this is a year uh, that we're going to have to accept it and deal with it. Uh, the coaches all made a point to say uh, this 20-game season in the conference is this year only. We're not agreeing to do this moving past this year. We'll revisit 18 or 20 a year from now. And the conference said, yes, this is a one-time deal, and uh, it's COVID-related. So uh, someone's going to be really mad uh, when they look at their schedule and they see they've got to go to – uh, four or five places against top contenders that uh, they didn't want to go to. They wanted one or two of them, and somebody's going to go to all four of them. And uh, it's not going to be fair, but it's going to be what it is this year. Does it kind of remind you in a way of like the Mount West tournament where you, know, you play a game, you have a couple of hours off to play another one, minus the entire elimination element of it, though, but like a full season of just those games stacked on top of each other? Yeah, I think what this is going to do, it's going to show – parity in college basketball that one team will win a game by 20 and 24 or 48 hours later they're going to get beat by 20 by that same team it's going to happen and it, what's going to stick out it's going to happen in back-to-back -back games instead of getting winning by 20 on your home floor in January and then getting by beat by 20 in February on the opponent's floor you're going to see it in a two-game turnaround how, how uh, hard it is to win a college game and how much difference there is between two teams uh, based on that 24 or 48 hours. All right, last one. And more on a lighthearted note, cardboard cutouts, you're going inside of the AHAS. Have you ordered yours already? I got to order them for the family. I know that much. But uh, uh, I don't know if they could ever agree on what pitcher I pick, so I'm going to let them pick their own pitchers. Uh, Dutch, getting back to not being ranked, Will you use that as motivation? Will the team use that as motivation going into the season? I don't think we're going to have to, John. I've got a motivated group already. They practice hard every day. Uh, the veterans are setting a good example. The young kids are catching up and, and trying to play Aztec basketball the right way. And this is just a motivated group. And so I don't think I'm going to have to use the rankings as motivation. It's just the, the excitement that we're going to get to play college basketball. After all the uncertainty and, and all the long wait, that it's just around the corner. And like all the coaches have said in the meetings and the team knows, there's a fine line. Uh, some team we're supposed to play might test positive. We might have a positive test and all of a sudden not be playing for two weeks. And so I know what the schedule is, but I think we're all just going to have to fasten the seatbelts and, and take the ride together that there'll be times we're, not, we're scheduled to play a game and it's not going to happen. And it's going to be that kind of year. So when we do get an opportunity to play, I think we'll be extremely motivated and happy to be on the floor representing San Diego State.